before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. been so, so kind to me. Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no words You paid it all for me You have been so, so Kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow.
Good morning. Thanks for joining us today at Newgate Baptist Church in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We're glad that you're choosing to worship with us. I'm going to read from Psalm 91 as we begin our worship. We're using this passage in our Wednesday worship, so you want to join us on Wednesdays. We also have a Zoom worship session, and uh, we're looking through Psalm 91 in the next few weeks. So let's just read it together. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disease or disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that you have joined with us today. Lord, we pray that even though we are separated from each other this morning, that you will bring us close in unity with each other and most importantly in unity with you. Lord, I pray that wherever we are at today, that we will feel the power of the Holy Spirit resting on our time of worship and our time of learning, that you will take the songs that we sing and you will um, just be blessed by the words and we will be encouraged uh, by by what we sing today and Lord that you will take your word and you will um, uh, take the the words of scripture that we learn about today and you will impress them on our hearts and on our minds so that we will become uh, more faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Lord we want to be um, people who are marked by your salvation that we know that we are saved and we live like we are saved and so God, today as we worship you, we declare that you are our God, you are our Savior, and we want to walk in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start this morning with the song, How Great Thou Art. And I hope that you've been able to get out into uh, nature this week. We've had a great uh, week of weather in Calgary and to just experience the greatness of God in nature. But the thing that we want to celebrate the most today is how um, God showed his greatness to us when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and brought us into relationship with himself. And so let's sing about that today. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout, thy universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art When through the woods 
And forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Good singing. We're going to um, continue to praise God today with a song, Hosanna. So if you're uh, in your living room or wherever you are, will you stand with us and just worship God together? I see the King of glory. Coming on the clouds with fire, the whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sins. The people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation. Rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as 
as we pray and sing, we're on our knees, we're on our knees, and Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest And heal my heart and make it clean Open up my eyes to the things unseen Show me how to love like you have loved me Break my heart for what breaks yours Everything I am for your kingdom's cause And as I walk from earth into eternity And Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. There are lots of things that you can get involved with um, at Newgate Church this week, and we want you to be a part of it. The um, announcements we're going at the beginning of the service and they'll go again once again at the end so you can get more details but there's something every night of the week so we've got a bible study uh, in the playgrounds uh, around the south end of the city here on monday nights and there's a uh, young adult bible study on tuesday nights and wednesday worship on wednesday we've got youth events every weekend and uh, just great stuff as well as prayer going on throughout the week so we want you to be a part of it also we are so excited about our summer ministries. So we've got a great staff team that have been preparing day camps for our kids. But the big thing that we're doing this year that we're so excited about is our uh, virtual vacation Bible school for the whole family. So we want and we're expecting that you're going to register and you're going to get a box dropped off to your house that has all the instructions for a great week and all the supplies that you're going to need. And uh, we've got our day camp staff to tell us about that today. And then we're going to, uh, so there's uh, the day camp staff are going to tell us about that, followed by a greeting video from Chris and Tim Berman in, uh, in England. Hi everyone! This year we're going to be doing VBS for the whole family. Our theme is Week of Miracles. We will be talking about the miracles of Jesus. These stories include the feeding of the 5,000. This year, like every other year, we're going to be having a wonderful skit written by us and we're going to have a magical performance by yours truly, Diego the Magnificent. We'll also be playing lots of games so you and your family can, can compete and also you'll be put into team colors where you can compete to win the ultimate VBS championship. And finally, everyone will have the opportunity to serve their community by participating in a variety of missions. So we'd love to see all of our new gate families this year. <laughs> Hello there, greetings from England. Yeah, it's um, a lovely sunny Sunday here and we just wanted to say hello and hope you're all, all right. Lockdown is easing here, so the thing that people are most excited about is going and getting the hair cut. Or going to the pub. Yes. Pubs just, are now open. They are now <laughs> open, uh, but with much less people in them, which is quite bizarre. So we hope you're all doing all right and that your lockdown is easing too. And um, yeah, I've been watching your services online and enjoying that. So yeah, great. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> 
Thanks for sending in your video. We love to hear from you guys. So keep sending in your videos to just bring you greetings to the rest of our congregation at this time. We're going to sing um, the saving one. So follow William on this one and uh, sing out. What mercy was revealed, what selflessness and peace. My fate was surely sealed until he rescued me. His pardon for my sin, his bounty for my need. From slavery and shame, I am redeemed. And heaven can't contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. No fear can hold me down. No darkness steal my joy, for blood has been poured out, the enemy destroyed. Death could not hold him down, the cross was not enough to steal away his love, for he is God. And heaven can't contain the glory of the sun. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved And anyone who calls upon his name They will be saved They will be saved And heaven can't contain The glory of the sun Jesus is the Christ the saving one his love has made a way the grave is overcome jesus is the christ the saving one we're going to continue to sing about um the freedom that we have in christ the salvation as we sing no longer slaves and um sing that out together you unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing 
this part out. Sing it like you mean it. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Sing it again. You split the sea so I could walk Stand and sing, I am a child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. God. Let's sing that one more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Lord, we just thank you so much that you have made us your children. And God, we tend to walk away from you. We tend to forget that we need a father. And so today we come to you and we just pray that um, you will just show us um, more of who you are, that you are our loving father who waits for us to come who wraps your arms of love around us and you forgive us, that you... um, take our sin from us when we come in repentance and you remove it as far as the east is from the west and so God today we want to declare that we are your children and we do not walk in fear we do not live in anxiety or um, any other kind of negative feeling but we live in faith as your children in Jesus name we pray amen Well, thank you, Will and Julie, uh, for leading us in worship and, and for the prayer. And now we're going to continue with um, the discussion that we started a few weeks ago. And we're going to be looking at, you know, just ministering uh, on the margins. And as I mentioned last week, um, the Gospel of Luke does a really great job of not only uh, sort of challenging us to minister in the margins, but he also challenges us to learn from those exact same margins. And so this morning, we're going to continue looking at that, right? Because I think that one of the problems that we have is that we often confuse the marks of, of um, worldly success with God's blessing and, and also the other way around, right? That, that we look at people that are on the margins and we say they're in the margins for a reason, or we talk about the people that are on the, you know, the the you know out of the margins in the in the center in the that that inside group, and we say they're there for a reason, and and God's hand is in both of those. And and one of the things that we learn very quickly when we read our Bibles is that Jesus does an amazing job of of tipping things upside down. Uh, he does a great job of of toppling over the frameworks that we construct, especially around things like what is true faithfulness or what is real success or what does it mean to be, you know, truly victorious. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And the passage that we look at does exactly that. Is It, it, it compares this outwardly focused, um, temporal, definition of, of, of success that we often operate from. And, and on the other hand, it, it starts to invite us to explore this, this inwardly focused, eternally unbounded um, definition of God's goodness and grace. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that. Um, and we're going to do that by reading uh, Luke chapter 16. And so if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to open it to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. And we're going to be reading uh, from 19 through 31. 
And as we prepare our hearts to do that, uh, we're going to enter into prayer, right? We're going to have a time of prayer. Um, And so again, like we've done the last few weeks, I'm going to give you an opportunity to gather your family or whoever you're sitting with and to just, or even if you're just sitting alone, to, um, you know, to enter into prayer, right? And as we do that, it readies our hearts. So let's do that. Let's just have about 30 seconds of, of just quiet where you'll be praying. And then at the end of that, uh, I'm going to pray for all of us. So let's do that. Lord God, as we prepare ourselves to enter into your word, we pray, God, that you would open up not only our ears, but also our hearts, our minds, that that what we read this morning, what we study this morning uh, would enter into us and would, you know, would change us, it would transform us. God, we pray that you would help us to look on your word with your eyes and that that we would see, you know, how, how so often we get um, success and victory and status wrong. And God, we want to we change that. We want to tip our understanding upside down so that we understand it the way you do. And so God, we know that we don't do that on our own. We do that as your Holy Spirit guides us. And so God, we, we, just, we pray for the Spirit to come and to, to open up our hearts and minds so that we can not only hear your word, but also go out and do it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking in chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at 19 through 31. But if you have time this afternoon, I would encourage you to look at the passages before. In fact, starting in 15, it sort of sets the, sta- uh, the setting. It sets the context of what Jesus is, is doing. So he tells this parable, this story. Um, and, and as he's doing that, he's sort of, you know, he's surrounded by not only his own followers, his disciples, you know, spiritual tire kickers that are coming to hear what he has to say, but there's also a number of people like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, so the, the religious leaders of the day, and, uh, and, and he speaks to them. And, and in that verses 15 through 18, you know, um, we see Jesus sort of, you know, talking about, you know, why he tells the stories that he tells and, and, and shares the teachings that he shares and, and how it is that, um, that the Pharisees miss it. Basically, he says they miss what he's teaching because they're looking for approval from people right? And, and the other thing is that, that they have done such a, a slick job of creating their own rules and standards that they've actually started to push the Word of God to the back burner and make their rules, their standards more important than the law and prophets. And so Jesus in this story gets, gets after that a little bit. So looking at Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 31. Again, uh, every week I encourage you to do this. I would love it if you would read your Bible, right? Get your Bible out. Um, pull it up on, on, on your device, but, but actually see the way that God's Word isn't just these floating paragraphs, but it's actually connected to a wider story. That's why I wanted to share and, and encourage you to read the passage before the one we're going to study this morning, because I think it helps us understand the way that the Bible works and the way that God's Word you know, has this, this narrative that weaves through it. And if we only read it in bits and chunks... Right, then we don't, we don't understand that. But anyways, let's, let's read um, verse 19 to 31, and it says this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received... Um, received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all of this, 
between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the grave. This uh, week, I actually uh, was involved in my my first funeral uh, of the COVID season. And so I just, you know, I I think that as as a church family, we need to remember um, Martin and Annie and, you know, uh, MJ Julius and Boom Boom, you know, uh, with the loss of Martin's father and grand, the, the kid's grandfather. And, and as I was thinking about this passage and thinking about uh, that occasion, it just spoke to me that it's, it, this is really a good reminder that there is an afterlife that we need to be thoughtful of, right? That, that there's something beyond what is here and what we see. And, and I think it's important for us as Christians to have a mindset of, of what's, what's going to happen beyond this world. And, and if we're not a Christian, I think it's a good time to start thinking about that, right? Talk to someone about that. But that's why I love this story. And I love the way that God does that, right? I, no one knew um, that Hill was going to, was going to pass away. And, and yet I knew this was the passage I was going to preach on. And it just sort of, the way that, that God brings these things together. And so, um, again, like I said, just a good reminder, an important reminder. Anyways, let's dig back into that passage, 16 through 19. It starts off by setting out um, who the characters are. And, and sort of the first part we get is this very worldly uh, um, sort of picture of, of who those people were and, and, and how they were thought of. We, we read here that there was a rich man and he was, he was dressed in purple and he lived in luxury and, and we get that. And, and maybe we don't understand that, but, but just the fact that he, he's dressed in purple I mean, he was dripping, right? He was, he was uh, wearing the, the fanciest of clothes. Uh, to dye something purple was a very difficult thing to do in that time. And so only the very, very wealthy were able to wear purple. And, and so that spoke to how much money he had. He had food, right? He had food. The, the abundance and the quality of his food, you know, gets hinted at. And we need to understand that, that, that the, his, his table is full and we'll read later about how the, the beggar, right, how Lazarus is just, you know, he's, he's, you know he's, he's looking for the crumbs, right? The food that this man has is so good that it's worth begging for the crumbs, right? His housing, he's got this beautiful house. He's, you know, it's a gated community. He's, he's insulated and isolated from, you know, the margins. And that's what we see, right? That's what we see. And, and as we look at that, um, some of the commentaries that I read, they, they said that right here, Jesus is kind of poking fun at, at some of the religious leaders that would have been in the crowd listening to him, right? The Sadducees and the Pharisees, right? Because it basically described the way that they lived, right? Wearing the fancy clothes, having, you know, all the jewels and the food and the, you know, the beautiful homes. Um, one of the commentaries even went so far as to say that, that Jesus was probably spotlighting Caiaphas, who was the high priest, because Caiaphas had five brothers. And if you remember in the story, the rich man had five brothers as well. And so it sort of hints at the fact that maybe Jesus knew that, that Caiaphas was going to be the man that would try him and ultimately send him to his death. And, and so just sort of an interesting side note. But definitely there was this idea that those were the people to emulate. Those, those people that were living that lifestyle, that's what you wanted. right? That was, that was who you were shooting for. And, and yet... The rich man is not the hero of this story, right? He's not the, the hero. And, and, and in fact, we know this because he doesn't even get named, right? He doesn't even get, he's just all the way through. It says a certain rich man or there was a rich man, right? But he never gets named. This is a great example of the way that Jesus tipped things upside down where he ran counter from the culture that he was in. And that would have been noticed by the people that heard that story, Right? Who is this rich man? Right? Because 
being named is to be honored. And if you're wealthy, that must mean that you're righteous and blessed and therefore you should be honored. And, and yet Jesus doesn't name him. In fact, the person that Jesus names in this story is, is the poor man, the beggar. We know his name, right? Because Jesus says that, that, that Lazarus was his name, right? Lazarus. Why was he honored? Why was he named? I mean, he's this man that, that it seems like he can't even get to where he needs to get to because it says that he's placed there, right? He was laid at the gate of, of the rich man, right? So he hasn't got that. And, and, and he has to beg for food, and he's covered in sores, and he doesn't even have the, the strength or the ability to, to, to smoosh away the dogs, right, that are looking at his sores. He's really not the person that you'd want to live up to, right? He's not the hero as we would normally see it. And yet God says, I'm going to give him a name. And so that means you need to pay attention to him because he's the hero of the story. And so we need to do that, right? It's interesting as you read that passage, um, we get the uh, sort of the idea that, that the rich man and Lazarus, you know, their lives are intertwined, because Lazarus, is, like I said, he's laid at the gate and he begs. And so every time that, that um, the, the rich man is having a, a, a party or, you know, every time food comes in or out, it would go past Lazarus. He would see that. He would hear that. He would smell that. He would know that, that the rich man had wonderful things just past that gate. And every time that rich man came into or out of his house, he would almost have to step over Lazarus to get to where he's going. So they both knew each other, right? They both knew each other. And yet we see that their stories go together even past this world, even past the grave, right? That, 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 um, that both of them, you know, both of them recognize each other. And so we want to do that because it reminds us that, that in this story, we probably recognize bits and pieces of ourselves, right? Um, if you read scripture, sometimes you can read it in a, in a format called Lectio Divina, and it's this idea of trying to, to sort of place yourself in the story. Um, there's more to it than that, but that's one of the elements of it, right? And to, to see who am I, right? Who am I as, you know, as, as the, the poor man? Who am I as the rich man, right? Who am I as one of the five brothers? And, and I think that's a, a powerful thing because these stories come together, right? And I think that it, it reminds us, too, that as much as we would like to say, oh, no, I'm definitely Lazarus, we also have to recognize that we're often the rich man as well. We're often like those Pharisees that Jesus was teaching to or teaching at in the, the telling of this parable, right? That, that we're wired to, to really say, even, even though Jesus is making it clear not to focus on the rich man, we want to focus on the rich man, right? We, that's who we want to be, um, just proof of this, that it's not very far into church history before um, the tradition of naming the rich man comes. And, you know, you'll read about him, and often he's referred to as Phineas. So even, even in spite of knowing that Jesus is teaching against doing that, and then he's saying, don't honor the rich man here because we want to focus on the poor man Lazarus, our wiring, it just, we have to name the rich man because the rich man has to be, you know, the star of the show because... He's got it all. He's got the, the, the wealth. He's got the clothes. He's got the food. He's got the house, right? We just don't get it, right? We just don't get it. And it's why we need to remind ourselves. And I, I'm, I'm saying we as in I'm in there, right? I'm part of that. And I have to be reminded that, that God has a different definition of, of success and a different definition of faithfulness and righteousness against what we would set up. And this story just helps us to understand it, right? So that's the earthly perspective. That's as we look at, you know, what life was like as they lived, right? So the, the rich man and the poor man and the differences, right? The incredible, the gap between them is, is, is huge. But there's another gap that gets talked about in this story that is even huger. And so let's look at that. You see, because what happens in the earthly perspective is different than what happens in the heavenly perspective. And as we continue in this passage, we see a difference right? We see that the roles are switched, that the fortunes are tipped, right? That the poor man is taken to Abraham's side, right? A place of blessing that, that's, that's 
you know, it, it's greater wealth than anything that could be known on earth, right? And we read that in the passage. It says that the angels take him to Abraham's side. And when we look at the description, the very next sentence, the very next part of this passage, we read about the rich man, and it just says the rich man died and was buried, right? So basically, you know, Lazarus gets carried off with this wonderful entourage of angels to this beautiful place, and the rich man just takes a dirt nap, right? And, and that's, that's the way that it gets described. The working out of, you know, Hades and Abraham's bosom and all of that fills a lot of, of the commentaries. And, and I think it would be an interesting thing to, to explore and to talk about, um, but that's not what I'm going to dwell on this morning. I want us to, to keep focused on, on the main ideas of this parable, and that is that things get exchanged in the afterlife, that Lazarus is now the one that's in comfort, and the unnamed rich man is the one that suffers unbelievable torment. And in fact, most of the, most of the parable focuses on the two requests that the rich man has uh, of Abraham. And we want to look at how Abraham responds. So the first one, as we read in the passage, the first one is, is that he says, um, he says in verse 24, so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Right? He's basically saying, Abraham, Father Abraham, right? Um, do, get Lazarus to do what I never did. Right? And that is, give me the smallest possible benefit of my immense ben, uh, blessing. Right? He says, I just, I just want, a, I just want a, a, a moist finger. He doesn't even say, give me a drink. He doesn't say, bring a cup. He says, just dip a finger in the water and, and touch that, that wet finger against my lip. Basically, come and give me a wet willy. Right? That's, I don't know if you ever went to camp or that. That was that where you stuck your finger in your mouth and then stuck it in your friend's ear right? And it was quite a rude awakening. But, but the rich man says, you know, it's so horrible here that that's all I want, right? I want Lazarus to just come do that. Now, I don't know about you, but um, one of the things of growing older is that I find I have a longer list of, of medications that I take. And um, one of them, it, it makes my, my tongue so dry, um, that, that when I wake up in the morning, I could use it as sandpaper, right? Like it's, there's no moisture, there's nothing. And, and I always keep a glass of water right by my bedside. And I just hope that the cat doesn't, you know, get into it in the night. But by the time morning rolls around, I, I don't really care. And I take a drink of it and I can just feel it soak into my tongue. And I just think of the fact that, that for all that with, um, just with my arthritis medication, that, that, that what this man is going through, what the rich man is going through is, is immeasurably worse he says that he's, on, he's in torment, he's on fire, right? Just, just a moist finger, right? Just a moist finger. And then we read Abraham's response, right, in verse 25. And he says, remember that in your lifetime, you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. And now he's comforted here, and you're in agony, right? And so, so the response is, hey, you get what you deserve, right? So, so you... You sort of checked out early, right? You cashed in early and you took the blessing in the world. And so for your whatever many years on, on life on earth, you were blessed and comfortable and you didn't share a bit of it. Right? And now, now you're, you're suffering for it. Right? And, and, and he says, you get what you deserve. He took his blessing in, 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 in his life and he forfeited the blessing in the afterlife, Right? And this was the way that justice worked according to how the rich man ordered the world. So we're going to come back to this again. So, so hear that, right? That, that Abraham is basically responding, almost mirroring or, 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 or repeating back to the rich man what he would have said to someone that would have come to him. You get what you deserve. This is the way it is. You did this, and this is the consequence. And so just live with it, Right? And, and that's what we see here in this passage, right? The, the rich man gets what he deserves. And then the second part that, that Abraham says is, and besides that, even if Lazarus wants to come and get you, and, and you, know, you get the idea that Lazarus, maybe, maybe he would have, right? If, he, if Abraham would have said, hey, would you share some of your blessing with the rich man? He would have. But, but Abraham says, but there's this chasm that's between you and him. 
Remember I said that, that, that there is a chasm between the rich man and the poor man on earth, but in the afterlife, it's immeasurably more, right? There, there's just no accounting for it. Like it's impossible to span the difference. And, and so he says, even if he wanted to, he can't come to you and you can't come to him, right? And, and that's the way it was, right? That's the way it was. There was no crossing over. And so I don't know, like it made me think, and I don't know, maybe it's just the way my mind works, but uh, now when you go into stores and you've got the arrows going up and down, you know, um, you can go down this aisle, but you can't go down that one. You've got to go, you know, north and north on one and south on another. And but the reality is you can cross over, right? That, and you see that all the time, you know, as people will be coming down and, they're, and then they'll look down at the arrow and go, oops, sorry, you know, and, or you can turn sideways and, you know, moonwalk or something to make it look like you're, you're actually going the right direction. But in, in a store, you can break that rule. But here Abraham is saying, this is, this is so much more. Like there is absolutely no way that Lazarus can, can bridge that chasm. There's no way. As much as he may want to bless you in spite of the fact that you never blessed him, he can't get there. And it doesn't matter how painful it is for you and how much you want to get to there, you can't make it, right? And it's just this idea that, that there is no bridge, there is no way across. And so the first request is just let Lazarus come and, 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 and quench my thirst even just a bit. And Ab Abraham says, no way. No way. And the second um, request that, that the rich man makes is he says, okay, if that's the case, right, if he can't come and, 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 you know, and help me, can he at least go and help my brothers? And he says, I've got five brothers, and i got five of them. Can Lazarus go, and can he make sure that they understand that? Right? So in verse 27, he says, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, Sorry, that's 27. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. He says, okay, it's horrible for me, and, and I get it. I get what I deserve, and I'm stuck here, and there's no hope for me. But can he at least go, and can he, can he tell my brothers? And Abraham responds. And again, Abraham responds in the negative. And when he responds, he says, no, no, there's no need. Your brothers don't need to have Lazarus come to him, right? Your brothers are just like you. They know the, the law and the prophets. They've read the teachings of Moses. They, they know the writings of the Old Testament. They are well-versed in that. And having Lazarus come and tell them, it's, it's not needed and it won't help, right? In other words, he says, they should know better. I should know better. And, and the rich man says, you know, he comes back to them and says, they have, uh, sorry, he said, um, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent, right? He says, look, at, they, they just need more. The, the writings, the, the, it's, just, it's just ink on a page. You know that, Abraham. It's just ink on a page, and it's not going to save anybody. They need, they need signs and wonders. They need something that's going to really like blow their minds, and then, and then they'll, they'll do it. But Abraham says to them, and you know, and this is, this is great, right? Abraham's response is great because, of course, remember that it's Jesus that's telling it. And so you can't tell me, right? You can't tell me that Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor because the response of Abraham is so tongue-in-cheek when you know what is going to happen, especially if he's poking fun at Caiaphas. But, but his response is, look, it, if, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Right? Even if someone rises from the dead. And so the two, uh, two requests from the rich man are both shot down. Right? They're both shot down. And I think that as Jesus finishes out that story, it's got to hit home for the people that are there. Right? You see, the Pharisees were the people that were on the inside. They were the privileged elite of their time. Yes, they were part of an oppressed group. Yes, Rome had power over them, but, but they were still privileged beyond what, what the other people in Israel were, right? And, and this is a teaching of, of Jesus that, that they dismiss because they're not on the margins, because they're stuck in their privilege, because they're stuck in their, their insider status, because they're stuck in, 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 in their power. And Jesus says, look, you've got to be like Lazarus. 
If you're going to understand the kingdom of God, you've got to understand the margin. We don't just minister to the margin. We learn from the margin. We come from the margin, right? And, and, and the Pharisees miss it because one, they judged on the outward appearance and two, because they elevated human standards above the law and the prophets. We got to be careful of that. Right? Remember what I said is that on one hand, it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, I'm Lazarus in this story. Well, you might be, but you're also the rich man, right? Because we all come from some element of privilege. We all have some amount of, of, of status that elevates us above others. And, and we can run afoul of it. We can start to look and say, this is what a truly Christian person looks like and acts like and talks like. Right? We can start to judge people on their outward appearance. We can start to say, well, yeah, there's all this stuff in the Bible, but these are the real important things. And we start to make up our own list, our own standards of what it is to be, you know, super Christians, right? To be, you know, neo-Pharisees. <laughs> um, at camp, I mentioned last week that, that Julie and the kids and I, we were out at the camp um, and it was kind of fun because we were around a campfire and we were singing those camp songs, you know, and, um, you know, we're, we're going to do some of those camp songs uh, in our summer camps, obviously. But we're also, I was talking with Julie and, and I think one of these Sundays we're going to actually do a bunch of camp songs. Um, one of the ones that, that we sang was maybe one that you know. Um, if I sang it, you still wouldn't know it. So I'm not going to sing it. But it's that one, I want to be a sheep. Ba 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 ba. right? It says, uh, I don't want to be a Pharisee. Because they're not fair, you see. I just want to be a sheep. That, that was sort of a song that kind of went through my head this week as I was reading this passage and reading the commentaries. Right? That, that, that we don't want to be Pharisees. We have to fight against that. We have to fight against that external focus. We have to fight against elevating our own standards. We need to make sure that we're, we're seeing the margins and we're learning from the margins as well. That, that we see Lazarus as being the one that's honored in this story, right? Now, all the way through this, I've mentioned that, that my reading of it is I understand it as a parable. There are some different opinions about that. That's good. Um, we can agree to disagree in all those wonderful phrases. Um, but I think it's a, uh, a, a nice parable. Um, you see, because the way that it's structured, right, is, is that, that Abraham is, is here and he's speaking as the voice of, of a pharisaical understanding of the afterlife, where Jesus, or sorry, where uh, the rich man says, um, can, can Lazarus come and just, you know, just, just you know, ease my, my, my suffering? And Abraham says, no way, you get what you deserve. And then later when, um, when, when the rich man says, well, then can you at least send him to tell my, my five brothers so that they don't go through this torment? Abraham's response is, forget it, right? If they don't know it by now, uh, they don't deserve to know it, right? They ought to know it. They ought to know better. Um, that's not the way that Jesus speaks, right? That's not the way that, that the gospel speaks, right? We see that, that um, Jesus comes with grace, Right? That, that God never stops pursuing us. In right? the story of the prodigal son, right? The, always watching for us, always excited for when we come home. Right? The Holy Spirit is continually nudging us towards revelation of, of who God really is. Right? That's, if, if, the, if Jesus was to speak to the rich man, I think the words might be different. But Abraham speaks the words that the rich man would have told others. And it's sort of this idea of this is, this is the pharisaical understanding of it. But the rest of the gospel shows us exactly what it means from, from Jesus' perspective, from the kingdom perspective. And in fact, we do see that, that rather than saying, why would I send a dead man? You know, if I send a dead man, it wouldn't make a difference. Jesus knows that a dead man rising from the grave makes all the difference. Right? And then this morning, I, I hope that, that you have a, a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and, and what he's done in your life. I hope that, that you don't have, a, when you read this story, I hope you don't have fear that, oh no, what if one day I wind up like that rich man in torment and in pain and, and separated? And you don't need to worry about that if you put your trust in Jesus. You see, because he was the dead man that did rise from the grave and he did make a difference. And he still makes a difference.
If you don't know who Jesus is in terms of what he's done for you, you as an individual, right? Then you need to talk to a Christian friend or, or you need to email me, right? Jeff.Logan at NewgateBaptist.ca. We need to talk about that because there is no reason to be afraid of, of falling in with the rich man because the love of Jesus Christ did span that chasm. It, it did, right? That chasm that, that Lazarus couldn't cross, that the rich man couldn't cross, Jesus did cross it. And he crossed it for you. And he crossed it for me. And at some point, we need to make a decision for that. At some point, we need to respond to that act of love. So if you've never done that, I'd encourage you to do that today. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for, for the love that you show by what you did on the cross. We thank you that, that we don't have to have the fear of, of, of the five brothers that, that may wind up in a place of eternal torment because, God, you, you, you took care of that on the cross. You, you died for us, and, and you extend your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy to us. And so, God, this morning, if we've responded in the past, we want to respond again and say thank you for what you've done. And if we've never responded, if we've never accepted that grace, then Lord, we want to make this morning special. And we want, to, we want to, to just accept your forgiveness right now. And so Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We want you to stand once again and just sing this great song, Jesus All for Jesus, as we go today. Make this your prayer for the week, that everything that you do, every decision that you make, you you um, do it uh, for Jesus, to live more clearly and more faithfully for him. Jesus all for Jesus, all I am and have, and ever hope to be. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have. And ever hope to be All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans I surrender these into your hands All of my Ambitions, hopes, and plans, I surrender these into your hands. For it's only in your will that I am free. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, I surrender thee into your hands all of my ambitions hopes and plans 
I surrender these into your hands. For it's only in your will that I am free. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Lord, we just come to you today and we ask that as we live our lives this week, that we will live faithfully for you, that we surrender everything to you, that all of our fears, our frustrations, our concerns, our um, triumphs and our joys and our hopes and our dreams, Lord, that we give them to you and we live our lives this week knowing that you are our father and that you love us and that you want to guide us and lead us and we want to live for you. So Lord, we just pray that um, today and this week we will be in step with you. We will feel the power of your Holy Spirit working in us and through us and we will be people that change the little bit of the world that we come in contact with this week in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one.